speaking of the Heritage Foundation, one of the the most laughable lies of the daily diet of lies that we get from that other camp is the idea. What's、uh, Project 2025? I've never heard of it. I have nothing to do with it. I have no idea what's in it. I'm not associated with it at all. It is truly bizarre that they got together, put this entire thing together, and of course, I know nothing. I mean, what 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 is this? It's it's laughable because it, it so utterly lacks even a, a, a scintilla of credibility. Hello and welcome to the Bullard Podcast. I'm your host Tim Miller. A, a quick update、uh, from yesterday's show on Nebraska. Bill and I were just getting a little concerned.、Um, we're gnashing our teeth over the possibility that the Nebraska legislature, with the encouragement of Donald Trump and Lindsey Graham and others, would change their allocation of electoral votes,、uh, which would have had major implications、uh, for Kamala Harris's path to, path to victory.、Uh, luckily, uh, it, uh, after we taped. Uh, there was some very positive news in that regard. A state senator, Mike McDonald, inter- interesting character. I might want to talk about more down the line. A former Democrat union guy who is socially conservative switched to the Republican Party. He didn't feel welcome in the Democratic Party because of some of his socially conservative views.、Um, held the line on this and and said that he would not support a change at this later date. And then my colleague Joe Perdicone in an interview with Senator Deb Fisher. Um, uh, Fisher told him that this is over; it's dead, and、uh, the Nebraska electoral vote allocation will remain as it is, which is good news for Harris, which gives her the blue wall path of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Nebraska too.、Uh, that would get her to 270 electoral votes. And today, I'm just delighted to be here with, I think, the only nationally syndicated conservative talk radio host who maintained his integrity. In the face of the Trumpian threat,、uh, it is Michael Medved. He's the host of the eponymous Daily Show that is available at medvedmedhead.com or on Apple Podcasts. His book include the American Miracle, Divine Providence, and the Rise of the Republic,、uh, and that book underpins、uh, the American Miracle podcast as well as a film adaptation scheduled for release next year. How you doing, Michael? It's great to talk to you. You know,、um, in the talk radio, in the conservative talk radio space. Um, as far as you know, if you're going to pick the top ten conservative talk radio hosts of the of my of my youth listening to in the back seat of my parents' car,、uh, uh, you're basically the only one that、uh, that held strong、uh, at the Trump takeover.、Uh, and so I'm、uh, I very much appreciate that, and、uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. What what why do you think that was?、Um, basically, because people's careers were threatened. And people's careers were lost、uh, because they didn't board the Trump train, and there was this idea that、uh, in order to get advertisers, in order to get audience,、uh, you had to go along with Trump because he was dominating the conservative movement, the Republican Party. I've never thought that was true. <laughs> I we we lost. In the process of of dealing with the onset of Trumpism,、uh, we we lost over a hundred affiliates, and that's、wow. stations where、uh, some of them had been carrying our show for twenty years, and、uh, and and then they wouldn't carry it anymore because、um, I, I, there was even stuff that I was supposed to sign with a syndicator. Uh, about limits on on what I could say, and I can't buy that.、Uh, this is not worth it. Limits all、uh, you can say about Trump. I, I, yeah, and and it's the and free basic- speech party, Michael. I'm sorry, I, I can't believe that that's true. Uh, these uh, folks by the are way, just committed uh, to free speech, un, un, unadulterated. All right, yeah. I I became a, a very early、uh, never Trumper. Uh, first of all, I was part of that now infamous、uh, career wrecking、um, uh, article on National Review、yeah. against Trump, yeah. and I was one of the people who put myself on the line there. And I said on the air that I could never support Trump back in two thousand fifteen, really early. You know why? Because the birther crap, right? 
because anyone who clearly was promoting that lie that the president of the United States was born in Kenya, uh, when, when the evidence was overwhelming that he was born in Hawaii, um, was just unacceptable. It's unacceptable if people knowingly lie uh, in order to advance some kind of career or political goal. Uh, it is, but uh, well, I mean, it's unacceptable to you, I guess. It, tur- <laughs> it turns it turns out that it's much more acceptable than maybe we expected. I like kind of reviewing that against Trump um, magazine cover at times because it's really <laughs> of non current Bulwark staff, well, <laughs> Bill Crystal and Mona. Uh, the late Dave, David Bowes, um, he held st- strong. Russell Moore, our friend, and you. That's it. That's the list. It's, so it was not really a career-ending uh, cover, actually, because about two-thirds of the people on the cover ended up um, flipping and, and either yeah, saying like for Glenn Trump Beck. or Trump-ish or Trump maybe. Well, Glenn Beck, I mean, yeah. what happened there? He He was part of that against Trump. Uh, article with the uh, National Review uh, as well. And he certainly, I, at least as far as I know, take that position today. Oh, no, he's an <laughs> enthusiastic Trumper, which takes us to why I want to get into your career a little bit because I, I think it's interesting. But um, for, for folks that, that aren't familiar, I, I just we, we should start here uh, since you use that word enthusiastic, or since we use that word enthusiastically. Um, it, uh, you, I'd, what had me reach out to you was I'd seen an article the other day where you indicated you'd be supporting Kamala Harris in this election um, over Trump. And, and in the green room, I just wanted to make sure I had it right. And, and your answer was that you're enthusiastically supporting Kamala Harris. So talk, talk about why that is. And is it just about the against Trump side of it? Or has there, there been something about Kamala that has appealed to you? No, I, I think that Kamala Harris is trying to build a broader coalition. Uh, and is working with everybody on the conservative side who is willing to work with her. And uh, I I would not have said I was supporting her enthusiastically. I was supporting her as the only alternative until the debate. But what was so great about the debate is I've, I've always said that the essence of winning that kind of televised encounter is to enjoy it and to look like you're enjoying it. And she was savoring her skewering of Trump uh, with so much uh, high spirits and and so much positivity and so much good humor. Uh, That made me enthusiastic. Yeah. What about just kind of the the tone? I I mean, I I do feel like she has made an effort to, in in a couple of areas, maybe less on the actual policy specifics, but more on, on appeals to patriotism, kind of rejecting some of the worst parts of the identitarian side of the left and kind of embracing a more traditional, you know, kind of American view about, um, you know, identity and pluralism. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like, and particular, and maybe on foreign policy as well, America's role in the world, like those are the things that have jumped out to me, but I, I don't know. Is, is, is that how, is it, did that strike you as well? Is there anything else? Very much so. I, I also loved the Democratic Convention, and I never thought I would say those words together. <laughs> I, I went to my first Democratic Convention in 1964 as a page uh, when I was a kid. I was in high school. And uh, that was a convention that nominated uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson yeah. and uh, Hubert Humphrey. And, uh, and I met Robert Kennedy there. And I was also part of the Kennedy campaign. I took a leave of absence from Yale. And uh, I was part of the Kennedy campaign in 68. And there was not since that time has the Democratic Party put on a show that was so flag waving. <laughs> and uh, they, if if someone had been asked which is the patriotic, uh, positive, uh, flag waving party, the Republicans or the Democrats, comparing their two conventions, it wouldn't have been close. I mean, the, the Republicans had Hulk Hogan and Kid Rock, and and of course every possible Trump relative. What they didn't have is any of the great people, like Mitt Romney. Uh, John McCain was unavailable, Uh, but uh, Mitt Romney or Lynn Cheney or Dick Cheney or President George W. Bush. I mean, 
the the idea that these people didn't even participate with the Republican Party. Instead, uh, well, they had uh, Mark Robinson, uh, <laughs> which is which is going well. I, it's he's practicing. It's, he's practicing some, some traditional values, depending on <laughs> what tradition you're talking about. <laughs> right. Exactly. I, what I love is the fact that he. He says he would like to go back to slavery because he would buy himself some slaves. Mm. Now, if that isn't a disqualifying remark, plus attacking Black Panther because it was made by, quote, atheist Jews. Um, again, and this is the guy who President Trump says is Martin Luther King on steroids. Yeah. Uh, and it is profoundly insulting for the uh, Republican nominee for president of the United States to say that Mark Robinson is better than Martin Luther King. Yeah. What What does that say about his real evaluation of Martin Luther King? Yeah, I'd say you probably put it in the dookie shoot, uh, to borrow a phrase <laughs> uh, from Mark Robinson. Um, I want to go back though. Really, I want to get to Mark. We're gonna get back to Mark. But your career, you said you you said something there that I I didn't. Well, I guess I knew about you that you had initially interned. From our, with RFK, because you talked about that with Charlie the other time you were on this podcast a few years ago. What I didn't know about you that I think is an interesting, um, there's an interesting line potentially from your objection to birtherism toward one of your first jobs was uh, in the Bay Area, where I lived for a little while, as a campaign to recruit more minorities to the police force. Um, <laughs> and I, I saw that when I was looking, and I was like, wow, that's a, that's a noble effort um, and, and something that maybe was probably not uh, the the conser the ethnic conservative POV in, in California at that at that time, and so I'm just wondering, like, what was your journey from there to getting into being a conservative talker? Well, it's a long journey, uh, and one of my books I'm I have 14 books, and one of my books is called Right Turns, which is about that progress from having been part of the Kennedy campaign. I was there the night of the assassination. I was just a couple of rows away from the front when Robert Kennedy made his last speech. Wow. And uh, again, uh, the police and working with the police, this was a LEAA grant, Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. It was a federal grant hmm. to hire more black cops for the San Francisco Berkeley and Oakland police departments and Richmond, California too. So those four departments and Sounds woke I, almost. well, I didn't know anything about cops at the time. I mean, I just knew <laughs> I, I once got arrested for camping without a permit when I was hitchhiking in San Clemente, California, but really I had had very little to do with cops. And uh, as part of this program, I spent, two years working closely with cops, doing ride-alongs, producing these TV commercials. And uh, they were great. And and virtually all the cops I was working with were black, hmm. but they were some of the finest people I ever met. I mean, I, and I, I, I still believe that. And that was a, a very big part of moving me to the conservative side of things because they had uh, about the same attitude toward the Bay Area left uh, that, frankly, white cops did. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was one of the guys I worked with, whose name was Harold, um, was a huge opera fan. <laughs> and, and straight, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Not okay. everybody. But it was it was an eye opening experience, and it was really very much part of my progress in a more conservative direction. One of the things that I found, and this is part of what has made me so skeptical of Trump, was during the time I was working in politics and working four years as a speechwriter and um, and and political consultant, yeah. and I, I worked at one point for Ron Dellums if you remember him, I don't. Uh, Bay Area congressman, very, very left, uh, okay. uh, not pro-American, not pro. And that also pushed me uh, to the right. But I, I had the sensibility, and I wrote about this in Right Turns, that 
people on the conservative side of things had better lives. And it wasn't uh, because they were conservatives. It was that uh, the the level of happiness, that, that part of the, the liberal idea, and this is uh, uh, very much... Uh, was part of this idea in the sixties was that the world is apocalyptic. It's, it's almost over Mm -hmm. that things are disastrous. We're going to be fighting in the streets. Uh, I always, even when I was an anti-war Democrat, the idea of, uh, the, the demonstrators who came to the convention in 68 and ruined the chance of a, a, a decent man named Hubert Humphrey. Uh, to win the presidency, all of that experience and contrast, and then and then there was Reagan, and I I joined Eldridge Cleaver, who supported Reagan, and Eugene McCarthy supported Reagan in 1980. Do you remember that? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And that that it seemed to me the morning in America idea, the idea of being more positive about this country. I think all the time about how blessed I am that my grandparents, my on my mother's side leaving Germany and on my father's side leaving Ukraine, that they chose to come here. That's the golden ticket. It's made of my life. I, I can't even imagine if my, if my grandfather had uh, stayed in Ukraine with his family, um, we probably wouldn't be alive right. today. Um, and that's it all. Yeah. No, no, it's terrible. My grandmother, my, my grandfather came to this country, um, it, originally in 1905 to earn enough money to bring six kids over to the U S and, uh, the kids didn't make it out before world war one. So they were stuck there. He lost five of his, of his six children. And then when he reunited with my grandmother, and they were both 50, my father was the American miracle because oh he God. was he was conceived when his parents were elderly. They had lost five children. I have their names on my billboard right in front of me. Uh, they had lost five children in the revolution uh, in World War I, and then most of all in that horrible civil war that most Americans don't know about that was vastly bloodier even than our civil war uh, between the reds and the whites. Have you or someone you know been a victim of identity theft, harassed, stalked, doxxed? Uh, it's definitely been a problem facing some of us in the Never Trump movement. And it's something that makes you reflect on how much of your data is actually out there on the internet for anyone to see. And the answer, more than you think. Your name, contact info, social security number, and home address, even information about your family members, all being compiled by data brokers and sold online. Data brokers can make a profit off your data. Anyone on the web can buy your private details. This can lead to identity theft, phishing attempts, harassment, and unwanted spam calls. But now you can protect your privacy with Delete Me. As a person who is very public, I'm hyper aware of safety and security, but even for those of you who aren't, you know, blabbing on a daily podcast and on YouTube, it's easier than ever to find personal information about you online. That's why I recommend Delete Me. Delete Me is a subscription service that removes your personal info from hundreds of data brokers. Sign up and provide Delete Me with exactly what information you want deleted, and their experts take it from there. Delete Me sends you regular personalized privacy reports showing what info they found, where they found it, and what they removed. To put it simply, Delete Me does all the hard work of wiping you and your family's personal information from data broker websites. Take control of your data and keep your private life private by signing up for Delete Me at a special discount for our listeners right now. Today, get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com slash bulwark and use promo code bulwark at checkout. The only way to get 20% off is to go to joindeleteme.com slash bulwark and enter code bulwark at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash bulwark, code bulwark. That is such a story. And the inverse to back to something else you were saying in there, and, and we were alluding to, just to put a finer point on it, like the inversion of now, the it's the MAGA that is the apocalyptic, that has the view of a, a negative view of America as it actually exists in the world. Um, and on the left, even on the left, it's 
we could do a whole cultural podcast about this, but despite the fact that the left is still, uh, you know, I think in a healthy way, pushing for change and supporting alternative family. I have an al- I, I have a family that would have been considered an alternative family not that long ago um, with a husband and an adopted daughter. But I, tr- you, the, the kind of happiness quotient that you're talking about, living a fulfilling life, caring about your community, lower rates of divorce, like all that stuff has flipped, right? Like you see that more among the kind of mid middle and upper income, like demo in democratic communities now. And like the Republican community is more hollowed out. Well, again, you, you ended up seeing a lot of, uh, positive, uh, Uh, people, very patriotic Americans. And this is the one thing that I give Kamala Harris credit for Mm -hmm. is um, they are determined to follow this morning in America script where the, uh, the Democrats are going to be more flag waving and uh, more, more pro American and certainly more pro American in the wider world. And this is not every Democrat. I and mean, we can leave uh, Alexandria sure. Ocasio Cortez off. off. <laughs> AOC's been Libra. pretty good. I don't know. Libra. Maybe maybe we'll leave Rashida to leave off. How about that? AOC's been pretty good lately. Yeah. And well, Ilhan Omar too. Yeah. And and and. But then again, you hold them up against uh, people like Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene, even though Marjorie Taylor Greene fighting with Laura Loomer mm-hmm. is something I appreciate the Bulwark's coverage. Of. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's like King Kong versus Godzilla. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, um, <laughs> except they're more likable. Uh, the, uh, the whole idea of, uh, America as a place of good fortune. I, in my in my book, The American Miracle, I talk about Lincoln when he was coming to Washington to take over the government in the midst of secession. There had already been uh, eight states who had seceded of the 11 who eventually seceded. And Lincoln spoke to the New Jersey legislature in Trenton. And he called America the almost chosen people. And that it seems to me is very important to keep in mind that that what are we chosen for and we're chosen for not special privileges but special responsibilities and right now i i I, democrats at the moment at least are more likely to get that point reagan certainly got it Uh, george hw bush and george w bush certainly got it but uh Today's Donald Trump does not, and uh, and and that it seems to me is a very real problem. The idea that America is a special country with a special mission, and that that's a mission that's been given by fate and history. Yeah, it's interesting. That kind of leads me to something else I wanted to talk to you about, which was there's this clip from Paul Ryan that was going around in May that I'm going to play for you. So it's a few months ago. So when you hear it, you can see he's referencing Biden being at the top of the ticket. But there, there's something he says at the end of it about what he's going to do, which is different than what you're going to do this November that I, that I want to talk about. Let, let's listen to Paul Ryan. Character is too important to me. And, and, and it's a job that requires the kind of character that he just doesn't have. Having said that, I really disagree with Biden on policy. I wrote in a Republican the last time. I'm going to write in a Republican this time. You're going to write in yeah. a Republican? I don't know who yet. So... I'm interested in your take on just the write-in choice altogether, but I'm interested in his phrasing in particular. I'm going to write in a Republican. Like, from my perspective, like, the Republican is just a party. It's not an ideology. It's a group of people. And this group of people have chosen Donald Trump three times. And so, like, this notion that there's, like, some true Republican out there from 20 years ago that he's going to write in, like, to me, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think that's kind of playing pretend. But maybe I'm too, maybe I'm too cynical. I don't know. What, what, what did you think about, about Paul Ryan's uh, explanation about his choice this November? I'll bet he changes his mind before November 5th. Really? That, uh, yeah, I know Paul, and he's a terrifically good guy. He's one of those leaders I admire who <laughs> wasn't at the Republican convention. Yeah. And wasn't really welcomed at the Republican convention. There were no prior show. Republican presidents or VPs at the convention. I, Palin would have been the only one that would have been welcomed, but I don't recall <laughs> her being there. No, and that's another story. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I made the mistake because in 2016, 
I was so certain, as most people were, that Hillary would win and would win in a landslide that I didn't see any reason to vote for her. Um, and because of policy disagreements, even though I've known her since law school. But in, in any event, uh, I voted for Evan McMullen, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, seems like a it's good better guy. than right, writing in Edmund Burke. At least Evan oh, McMullen right. was alive. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, when, when that election happened and Trump actually won, I felt very guilty for not having a, at least voted for the alternative candidate. And I, I resolved that I would never do that again. I mean, it's stupid to to basically say that, well, there is no choice. There's always a choice. And even if you're in the state of Washington where Trump is not competitive anyway, uh, it still matters. And every one of those votes matters because that's part of your legacy in defining who you are. In the lead up to the 2024 U.S. elections, more people than ever are wondering how our electoral process actually works. What systems are in place to ensure secure and accurate results? And how can we recognize misinformation and be able to fully participate in our democracy? The new season of Democracy Decoded, a podcast by Campaign Legal Center, covers all of this. You'll learn from top lawyers and democracy's frontline heroes, such as poll workers and civil rights advocates, to understand how our elections function, the potential threats they face, and the checks and balances in place so voters can rest assured that the election results will reflect the will of the people. Because here's the thing. Our electoral system works, and Democracy Decoded will help you understand why. Listen now at democracydecoded.org or on your favorite podcast app. And a big thanks to Democracy Decoded for sponsoring this show. What about the point about um, just like what is, you know, the last true Scotsman element of this? Like what is a true Republican? I mean, at this point, do you think there is something that is salvageable, that is that there is a potential that it could return to something like what had appealed to you before 2016? Or are, are we going through a time of just um, such change? you know, in the makeup of what it means, of what each party represents that like that going forward, uh, you know, the Republican will just mean something different than it had in the past. It's not like I, that's I don't not wanna, the first time this has happened. I don't want to simplify my answer, but I do okay. believe that uh, when Trump loses and I, I think, I think he will lose and I don't think it's going to be excruciatingly close uh, and not as close as last time even. And, and Biden, which people tend to forget, won in the popular vote by 7 million votes. Yeah. It was a good margin. Once he loses a third time in the popular vote, because he lost uh, to Hillary by 3 million votes in 2016. Once that happens, I think the fever has passed. And it may not heal immediately. We, we still may have a J.D. Vance to deal with. Right. But... Right now, if you look at the Republican Party, I think it's more viable to see non-Trumpy people who rise in the future than any of the potential uh, Trump acolytes. I mean, it's not going to be Don Jr. It's not going to be J.D. Vance. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure Matt Gates would want to make a go of it. Uh, maybe Tucker Carlson. Uh, but again, their list of potential standard bearers for the Trump movement, for the MAGA movement, is not impressive. And there are people, uh, I'm, people like Nikki Haley, who I think ran a good campaign. And one of the interesting things, and it's a, a point that I think Brett Stevens makes, among, among others, uh, if Nikki Haley had been the nominee uh, do you think she would be losing to Kamala Harris? I don't. I think uh, she would be uh, very much more competitive. And that would actually be kind of a fun election because <laughs> there are two people who are bright and interesting. And uh, again, um, who have you must have thought about this. Who do you think is yeah. um, a st new standard bearer for the MAGA movement? I just think it's hard with the counterfactuals with Haley, for example, because 
I, she really didn't have a base within the party. I mean, she was getting 17% of the vote, but like half of those people were functional Democrats that were crossing over to vote for her. Maybe they were Republicans at one point, but like people that are voting for Joe Biden and voting for Kamala. Uh, and so, you know, what would MAGA have done? You know what I mean? Like, I just think that there's a lot of counterfactuals there. I, I, yeah, no, I, I mean, look, if either J.D. Vance or Ron DeSantis had a personality, they would be the obvious like standard bearers, I think. I think it would be probably somebody that can bridge some kind of new fusionism, right? Like that's what that's what all was all the talk, right? When as you were coming up in politics, is fusionism between the libertarian wing and the social conservative wing, and I think there'll need to be some kind of fusionism between Trumpism and like the old establishment that does take from some elements of Trumpism that I don't really like, like, you know, and I think particularly when it comes to Nate, you know, the natives nativism side of it and, and the maybe not isolationism, but more restrained view of the U S and the world. I think that stuff's here to stay. Don't you? Well, U S retreat from the world. I think that's here yeah. to stay for people like Ron DeSantis. It's certainly yeah. here for, for JD Vance. Uh, I mean, the complete capture of JD Vance by Trumpian uh, ideology, uh, the the anti-Ukraine uh, ideas of people like J.D. Vance and, and Ron DeSantis. I, I'm, Ron DeSantis, one of the biggest disappointments in recent American politics. And I think it's, uh, uh, by, by the way, I, uh, what is your understanding of how the abortion rights, so-called uh, measure is going to go in Florida. Uh, I mean, if if it follows the pattern of the other 10 states where where this is an issue, uh, it could be a very big defeat for Governor DeSantis, no? I like that a classic three-decade radio host is taking over the hosting duties for me and turning it, turning it back on me on these questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, that's, please take the chair, Michael. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that the abortion rights bill will, or amendment will pass. In yeah. Florida, I do. And and again, uh, it's it's just when you look at some of the maybe you even include Glenn Youngkin as part of the sure. uh, Republican future. But I um I I think that once we get away from Trump and his immediate family and his <laughs> aides and acolytes and sycophants. And all of the rest of them, and and I don't see if they lose a third time. That's William Jennings Bryan territory, uh, you know. Who, but, but he didn't course. run three times in a yeah. row. He ran twice, then took a break uh, to have a Democrat lose to Teddy Roosevelt, and then came back again in two thousand and eight to lose to Taft. And losing to Taft is is not uh, something that <laughs> you want to hold up as a yeah, unfortunately Trump example. did have the one win in there. William Jennings Bryan didn't have the narrow electoral college victory to offset it, but um, yeah, I, I well look, I appreciate the optimism that you're bringing to this. Uh, it's needed around the bulwark. Some of us are a little more fatalist about the about these things. I do though. I just, to go back to the Paul Ryan question just one more time, and, and Stevens, you, who you mentioned. You know, Stevens has an article in the Times this week about what Harris must do to win over skeptics like me. And, you know, she's talking about how he hasn't she hasn't given answers to Middle East foreign policy questions to the degree that he would like. And I'm just like, if if the future that you're putting out, the optimistic future is true, right, where Trump gets defeated soundly and where some level of normalcy returns, God willing, to the party like that requires people like Brett Stevens and Paul Ryan like trying <laughs> trying doing what you're doing doing what Michael Medved is doing like the thing that's been so dispiriting to me is that like there's been the like the people that know better there's there's a lot of category of people that kind of uh, you know they'll say the right thing sometimes and not other times and they're wishy-washy and and there is not the effort that I would like to see to really put this man where he belongs in the dustbin of history. Doesn't that frustrate you? Yes. And I believe, uh, I know Brett and admire him greatly. I think he's a wonderful writer and he's a wonderful American and he's a great defender of uh, the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And I happen to believe that uh, Brett is setting himself up so in the last two weeks before the election, uh, 
he can finally come over and it, it'll be news because it, every week he does this thing with Gail Collins, which I find very entertaining, the back and forth they have in the New York Times. And she asks him every week, well, have you come around yet? And I think he is assuming that it can have a deeper impact if he waits till the last moment. And I, I, at least I hope that is the case. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm invited he, I, him on. I'm hoping. I'm hopeful he's on in the next coming weeks. There's no no better place than the Bulwark podcast than to finally come around. Though I do again, though, just the I, even the the playing pretend of will will or won't he? Like to me, I understand how maybe you could argue that that gives get it more power. But to me, it's like this isn't a close call. Like as you said, like this isn't a close call. Like why are we pretending like it's a close call? Mitt Romney is in the Deseret News this morning. Like. I'm wor- uh, that where he says that there's worry about, you know, if Trump comes in, that he'll go after foes like people like him. And like, if that is legitimate worry, like, wh- what are we doing? Like, why aren't you out there in in Nevada rallying Mormons for Kamala? Like, is she, I, I, that that's the thing that is missing for me, that it, it feels like you've seen the light on. Yeah, I, but I, I do. I do agree with you. And uh, the one thing that I had uh, read, there was a piece recently about Mormon organizations and Mormon leadership in Nevada, where it matters, where they have, I think, together with Idaho and and, uh, Utah and Arizona, they have the most substantial Mormon population, uh, where there are people who are rallying uh, uh, to to support Kamala. Because, again, the... The worst that could happen uh, with with Trump is is so very bad. I mean, so incredibly terrible. One of the things my wife was was looking at recently was a list of people who have had their sentences commuted uh, uh, or uh, basically been pardoned by uh, President Trump and how many of them have reoffended and done horrible crimes since they were let out of prison. I mean, the prospect of um, basically pardoning or uh, commuting the sentences of uh, a thousand January 6th rioters. Are, are you kidding me? Insane. And, and, and again, people there's that whole thing of we we don't take him seriously but we take him literally or is it that we take him literally but we don't take him seriously i think we should take this literally and seriously and say no uh this this can't be uh and the fact that the trump has said he said very clearly that he will uh, not support squishes like Jeff Sessions, remember, <laughs> that, that he will, uh, I, no more Mike Pompeo, I don't think. And, and uh, again, the, the possibility of, of horrible consequences to NATO, uh, which is, I, I, it, that again, because of my family's background. Yeah. Uh, the idea that we would betray the Ukrainians and and in, in the process betray the Brits and the Germans and everybody else in NATO uh, is is so appalling. And I I do believe that bringing real indignation to these issues is appropriate. Yeah. We've uh, we've covered the uh, foreign policy side of this, the constitutional side, the character, uh, but even on the economic side, there's the seriously but not literally question. Uh, I have another clip. This is just Trump um, earlier this week on on what he plans to do with tariffs. I've spoken with some economists about your proposal for tariffs, and they say they don't see how it would not make items cost more in the United States. Oh, they'll they'll approve it. They'll approve. And number one, I don't need them. I don't need Congress, but they'll approve it. I'll have the right to impose them myself if they don't. <laughs> Unilateral tariffs without Congress. I why aren't where, where is the Wall Street editor, journal editorial board on this? Where like I, I don't understand why people like when, fiscal when conservatives make, aren't freaking out about this. When did he make that comment? 
It was just, I think it was either yesterday or over the weekend. It was a couple of days in the last couple of days. It's unbelievable. He is such a deep constitutional scholar. Uh, I, I don't need them. Uh, it, it's just, it's just mind blowing. And, and you're right. Uh, in terms of the stock market, investments, the help of the economy, jobs, uh, the, the potential for a real disaster. And by the way, I don't think Steven Mnuchin is coming back. Uh, I think the number is that there are of the 44 people who held cabinet level positions with president Trump, four of the 44 are supporting him. And, uh, we have on the radio all the time, uh, people, uh, secretary Esper, John Bolton, yeah. uh, people like that, whose entire lives are marred by the fact that they thought they could make things work by working for Trump, going over to the, it is the dark side. And, uh, and and by the way, and and now one of the things that is most appalling to me of all is uh, President Trump saying that uh, it is harsh words about him that have uh, produced the assassination attempts. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, when his words about his opponents who are vermin, he has used that term, and who are trying to destroy the country and will do anything they can to wreck the United States. I mean, really. Speaking of Trump's terms, I would like, I would like to hear your take on um, the, the eating of the cats and dogs. But there's one other, but there's one news story this morning that I just had to share with you. I don't know if you've seen this yet. I'm, I'm hoping I can surprise you. It's in The Guardian. Kevin Roberts, uh, the president of the Heritage Foundation, um, who has led the MAGA Trumpy turn of the Heritage Foundation, mm -hmm. what used to be a, a history professor at New Mexico State University. Several sources at New Mexico State University all told The Guardian this. Uh, he was discussing in the hallway with various members of the faculty that a neighbor's dog had been barking relentlessly and was keeping the baby and his wife awake, and he kind of lost it and took a shovel and killed the dog. End of problem. Three three separate sources on that. That uh, terrific. Kevin Roberts Maybe he was dog. part of the Christy Noam coalition. <laughs> I mean, that like, dog killing coalition. The Haitians are eating the dogs and the cats. Allegedly, <laughs> we have no evidence of this. But right. Christy Noam and Kevin Roberts, two prominent MAGA officials, are are known dog murderers. It's you know, every every uh, accusation is a confession. I guess uh, th this is extraordinary. No, I hadn't heard this. Thank you for <laughs> for sharing it with me. Uh, and and uh, by the way, that that goes. Speaking of the Heritage Foundation, one of the the most laughable lies of the daily diet of lies that we get from that other camp is the idea. What's uh, Project Twenty Twenty Five? I've never heard of it. I have nothing to do with it. I have no idea what's in it. I'm not associated with it at all. I also think it's kind of strange that um, Kamala is putting so much emphasis on project 2025 there's so so much other yeah. uh material you can focus on you don't really need to go there but it, it is it is truly bizarre that they got together put this entire thing together had i believe it's um jd vance wrote the introduction to kevin roberts mm, book right he did and and of course i know nothing i mean yeah. what 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 is this it's it's laughable because it, it so utterly lacks even a, a, a scintilla of credibility. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over five million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. All you do is pick more or less on player stat projections, and you can watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is the best way to get action on sports in most states, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Prize Picks puts their members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When your picks hit, you can get your money in as quick as 15 minutes. And Prize Picks invented the flex play, which means you can still cash out if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money even if one of your picks doesn't hit. Let me tell you, earlier this week on Monday Night Football, we had LSU on LSU. Joe Burrow versus Jaden Daniels. And, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had 
I had, I had some scoop on this. I felt like I knew what was going to be happening in this game. I got in heavy on Jamar Chase, the LSU wide receiver that Joe Burrow throws to. I knew he was going to have a big game against the Commanders. We're calling them the Commanders now. And you know what? I was right. Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase didn't win the game, but Jamar Chase did hit his over on catches, yards, touchdowns. And, you know, it's a fun way to watch a game, especially if you already missed getting in on a fantasy team at the beginning of the season. Download the Prize Pick app today and use code Bulwark and get 50 bucks instantly when you play $5. That's code Bulwark on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play just $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks run your game. Yeah, I probably. Um, Indeed. I promised you that we'd get back to Mark Robinson and, and with J.D. Vance. I do have one more clip for you that we got to play uh, okay. before uh, before we close down the the recent news. It's, it's sort of like a low light reel. You know, it's like the opposite of the Sports Center top 10 we're doing. You know, the the bottom five clips from the last couple of days of MAGA World. Here's a J.D. Vance talking about uh, what he thinks about Mark Robinson. A sex scandal in North Carolina is between the lieutenant governor and the people of North Carolina. They're going to make their decision and we support them. I mean, like, what is this? I was talking to Bill Crystal about this yesterday. Uh, just kind of this postmodern nihilism of uh, the J.D. Vance MAGA world. It's like, there's no right and wrong. There's no, this is good or bad. He should or should not do this. It's, well, let's just kind of let it play out in the court of public opinion. Uh, yeah. And and again, it's... um. The J.D. Vance phenomenon is very, very strange because one of the things that I think is true about Trump is I don't think he's all that bright. Uh, I mean, he he just doesn't uh, doesn't seem to have a a background, despite the fact that he went to the Wharton School, as he brought up in the debate. Uh, but but J.D. Vance obviously is very bright, and he said. He said worse things about Trump uh, early on than I did, and right. <laughs> and and the the idea that he has turned around so completely on the other side and is backing this ludicrous uh, a charge about they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats, they're eating the pets of the people who live there. I think it's made a great song, you know, and the yeah, that's uh, true. Um, uh, but it's it's so ludicrous, and and then Mike Dewine. It's kind of worse who, than ludicrous, really. Though it's it's like depraved. I mean, it's it goes back to the birther stuff. It's racist. It's like just it's yeah. wrong. And and especially this is one of the things that I I try to stress on the air. These Haitians in Springfield, Ohio, are not illegal. Right. They are legally authorized. And and again, Mike DeWine in a piece in the New York Times, the governor of Ohio, former U.S. senator from Ohio, lifelong Republican, solid Republican conservative. Uh, he actually wrote a, a moving piece about how much this was damaging the city that he grew up in yeah. and that he loves. And it's very sad. I, I, if there were any justice in the world this malpractice, political malpractice, would make Ohio competitive again. I, I remember the days it was considered a swing state. And uh, wouldn't it be terrific if, uh, if, if things were more competitive in Ohio and in Florida as they once were? Yeah, maybe for Sherrod Brown, at least. I, I do think that's a more competitive race potentially. But um, yeah, Trump thing, on just on one more thing on the Haitians being legal. Trump at a rally last night, I don't have this clip, but um, I, they started talking about sending them back. And the, the, there was a crowd chant at the event last night in Pennsylvania, send them back, send them back, about the legal Haitian immigrants. I mean, it's really well, this, this is This is, to me, the very center of why the idea of writing someone in or, or not voting to make sure Trump not doesn't become president. He is talking about deporting 20 million people. He's used that figure. Uh, there are only at most 11 million 
undocumented immigrants in the country. So he's going to find a bunch of other immigrants who are legal, like the people in Springfield, Ohio. And he wants to build detention camps where you would take people, take them away from their American-born children in many cases, and people who are who are doing doing jobs and part of the community, part of being on the radio. We had a situation where I'm sort of very well known, uh, particularly here in Seattle, where we're based, uh, to for a pro immigrant position. I, I like to say my my position on immigration is the same as President Reagan's, yeah. which is my all four of my grandparents were immigrants and. And I think it's been a great source of strength and vitality and goodness for the American experiment. In any event, we were contacted. Uh, there was a family that was picked up um, after living in America for 20 years. They had four American-born children. Uh, they were from Guatemala. The guy was a president of a church. And... Uh, and, and he had a car business where he had like six employees they were doing. And the idea of taking people away from their lives and putting them, they had a, a this holding pen yeah. in Tacoma, Washington. Ugh. And it's nightmarish. This, this is the fact that our government is uh, perpetrating that kind of hardship on people who are building lives, going to church, uh, uh, basically employing other people, building the economy, raising their children who are in public schools. And by the way, don't really speak that much Spanish because they've grown up here. Right. Uh, the idea of, of expending tens of thousands of dollars to arrest these people, to hold them in detention, and then to transport them to countries that don't want them. And by the way, this is one of those things where I, I, I do think Kamala has to be more rigorous. Uh, Trump says all the time, they're taking people from mental asylums, from insane yeah. asylums, and from the jails, and they're deliberately taking all those people. And that's why, supposedly, according to Trump, the crime has gone down so much in Venezuela and elsewhere. None of this is true. Right. And really, there has to be more of an ability to to educate uh, the American people to to the extent that many of the things that Trump is, has been saying repeatedly over and over and over again are just things that he knows very well to be lies. Yeah. All right. Well, I have to do one last thing for you. I just that I'm, I've just been dying to ask you before I let you go. Uh, you just now look back on it. Three decades of the talk radio. I, I was re-listening to your interview with Charlie, where you talked about the callers that you had, and you have these relationships, and some of the callers have, have broken up with you. <laughs> uh, and and I just wonder, like, do you look? Is there anything that you wish you would have done differently? Is there anything that you look back and you think, man, uh, the conservative radio movement, uh, you know, maybe got caught up in in something? I don't know. And do, any life lessons from this kind of strange trajectory we've been on? Uh, yeah, I, I think that, that I stayed with the same indicator, uh, longer than I should have given their shift in emphasis and, and their attempt to dictate content. Mm. Uh, it's, it's hard though. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Hugh Hewitt's doing a great job over there. I should just say, just doing exactly what the bosses are looking for. Oh, no, gosh. and and it's it's sad too. I mean, because uh, I know you forever. I I was with Salem before you was, and and I, I recommended him uh, to Ugh. to come join us at Salem. And the difficulty is, he did a uh, a column, terrific column, and this was at the time of the Republican convention in Cleveland in 2016. Hugh did a column about we're heading toward a crash and we have to seize control of the plane and we have to take the plane because uh, basically what he was saying in the column was uh, that if we, if we stay with Trump, 
uh, we're going to lose and the party will be lost. And his terrific column, uh, and he was pressured to retract it and, and did. And the next day, I think two days later, had another column talking about how Trump was a bold new path for the Republican Party. And uh, and remember when Hugh, they had a debate in Las Vegas. and You asked him about the triad. He, right. And do you remember what Trump said to him? <laughs> he didn't know what the triad was. I forget what his exact quote no, was. No, Trump but. said, I don't, I don't know. I don't care. And I don't care about that kind of question from a third-rate uh, disc jockey with no ratings. And uh, again... There are, I, I don't know about, about you, but uh, the most painful thing has been sort of the strain on and the end of some friendships. I mean, people who have been friends in my case for uh, tens and tens and tens of years. And the worst thing is when some of those people write about never Trumpers, they just want to be invited to the uh, to the Washington cocktail parties. Yeah. They they want to be part of the... I don't think I've ever been to a Washington <laughs> cocktail party. I, I mean, it, it just isn't on my social calendar. But um, I, I, this is a deeper issue than that, as yeah. you very well know. Yeah. Well, hopefully at least some positive stuff some people that surprised you or some you know d meaningful relationships some listeners that you stuck over did you win anybody would you win any of those callers over yeah yeah a few i get particularly because of my my last two books god's hand on america and uh the american miracle uh there have been a lot of uh uh, individuals that we've won, a lot of listeners and people who write in and appreciate the books. And we're doing a podcast of American Miracle podcast, which basically the uh, subheading for uh, the American Miracle is uh, uh, America is no accident, that there is such a thing as fate and uh, and a blessing. and And the blessing is not to reward Americans, it's to impose responsibilities uh, on us as the, as Lincoln says, the almost chosen people. And this ends for me with uh, one of my favorite quotes, which I use in the book. And it's not from an American politician, not from a Republican, it's from Otto von Bismarck. And Bismarck once said, it is the job of any statesman to listen for God's footsteps in history and then to grab his coattails and hang on. Hmm. And I, I believe that in the last weeks of this election cycle, you can kind of hear God's footsteps in history, and they're not going in a Trumpy direction. Your lips to God's ears. That's a great place to end. Michael Medved, it is, I think, tells you everything about the devolution of the movement and the party that uh, your your slot was replaced by Sebastian Gorka. Uh, I, do, I, do, I don't think God's footprints were involved in that one. Uh, uh, by but, the way, uh, who calls yeah. his show? Yeah. You know what he calls his show? I, I, I'm happy to say I don't know. Please share. America first. So Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh uh, can uh, be very, very proud. Uh, but uh, again, the idea that more people don't know about the heroic resistance to isolationism. And uh, you have uh, people like uh, that uh, Daryl, who, who was on with uh, Tucker Carlson, who thought that Winston, Shur Winston Churchill was the big villain of World oh, War II. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In any event, uh, there will be brighter days. And, and, and I do think we will all feel a sense of liberation, relief, maybe even exhilaration at uh, the results, God willing, on, on November 5th. Hope you're correct. Thank you so much to Michael Medved for joining the Borg Podcast. Uh, let's stay in touch. We'll be talking to you soon, and we'll be back here to do it all again tomorrow. Peace.